Dr. Hassan. I'm really thrilled to be able to moderate this next section that will um, talk about frontiers in dementia diagnosis, therapeutics, and preventive health. And so our first speaker, I'm really honored to introduce Dr. Eddie Koo. Um, I've known Dr. Koo for the last 12 years or so. Um, we're just absolutely thrilled to have him visiting us here from Singapore. So Dr. Koo is professor of neurosciences, both at University of San Diego, um, University of California at San Diego, and also at the National University of um, excuse me, um, National University of Singapore, the Yong Yu Lin School of Medicine. And Dr. Um, Ku has done a, um, extremely important research, has been a world leader in Alzheimer's disease, better understanding the cellular and molecular biology of Alzheimer's disease and how that relates to therapeutics. So we're really thankful to have you here and thank you for making the long journey. Welcome. Thanks, Cindy. Uh, th uh, thanks, Cindy, and thank you, Sanjay uh, and Dr. Page. It's a, a great pleasure to come here and and uh, and chat about a little bit about my work. And uh, uh, yesterday, I had the opportunity to, to walk around uh, the lake, uh, uh, and so that was a, uh, a particularly good, uh, fun time. So, does this take me forward, or do I have to set something? A couple more. All right, okay, thanks, thanks very much. So um, I was assigned a topic that's in the therapeutics area, and, and while I did have a little foray in, in looking at AD therapeutics uh, uh, some time ago, this is not something we're currently doing, so I'm gonna twist the topic around and talk a little bit about the, uh, the animal modeling we've been doing, and uh, unfortunately, I put in this title that where are our animal models failing us? Because uh, I had expected that I might learn a little bit more about AD from the, mo the uh, model that I'm going to tell you, but it turned out to be a little bit unexpected. And uh, first is uh, yesterday, Ron Peterson was given uh, uh, an extra title for being president of Johns Hopkins. And, uh, and I want to thank uh, uh, Sanjay for giving me an extra degree, uh, <laughs> uh, which I don't have. So unless the badges give me an honorary doctorate, uh, I have to uh, uh, take that away. So, uh, so okay. So uh, 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 Alzheimer therapeutics uh, uh, in rodent models. So the, the good news is that uh, there are many ways to treat AD uh, uh, in mice successfully. Uh, the slightly disconcerting news is that there are more than 100 different ways to successfully treat AD in rodents, and we heard uh, a couple of them yesterday. Uh, uh, the bad news is that uh, none have worked in humans. Uh, uh, so the, the question is then why? Uh, what's wrong with our models, and why are they not predictive of, of uh, um, therapeutic success uh, in humans. So the going back a little bit uh, uh, for the audience here, especially the students, I mean, typically, how do drug companies carry out their R&D research? Well, the first is you need a testable hypothesis. Uh, so in the AD field, then uh, 20 years ago, there was a cholinergic hypothesis, or maybe 30. Uh, and then now 20 years ago, and that we've been still been pursuing is the amyloid hypothesis. Uh, you need good models uh, uh, to advance the preclinical studies, of which you have lesioning models. That's a very traditional method. And then more recently in AD, as you'll hear shortly, the APP transgenic mice. Uh, and then obviously you need a tractable target, or in uh, drug uh, discovery parlance, it's, uh, you need it to be a druggable target. And so we have obviously acetylcholinesterase, the basis for uh, uh, the current uh, um, therapies for AD, and then also secretases, the uh, beta gamma secretases, which you'll hear a little bit uh, at the end. And obviously you need good uh, clinical trial design. And in our case in AD, it's really improvement in tracking disease progression. Uh, that's uh, uh, been a, uh, a hurdle for us as, uh, as you know, and I'm sure we'll hear that using just uh, clinical endpoints is rather difficult. And finally, of course, uh, is earlier disease identification. So that's kind of a tall order for us to, to, uh, um, to climb. And then, then I'm going to focus now only on the, uh, the animal models, which is the, uh, currently the transgenic amyloid models, uh, which are really intended to model not just, not really AD, but for amyloid deposition, uh, which you can appreciate here in uh, seeing all the black dots uh, representing amyloid deposits in the transgenic mouse brain. So until recently, virtually all the rodent models overexpress APP, the amyloid precursor protein. Uh, where after proteolytic cleavage, uh, AM amyloid or A-beta uh, is uh, produced and deposited. Therefore, we really cannot 
exclude uh, effects that are from APP overexpression. Uh, uh, the, unfortunately, most of the models show little or no cell loss, unlike, as we know, uh, happens in Alzheimer's disease. And uh, no one single disease-associated mutation can drive the full spectrum of AD pathology in mice, especially tau pathology. So basically, all the models we have are incomplete uh, phenocopies of AD. And uh, we're also unable to link the amyloid and tau pathology in animal models. That is so critical uh, because, as you know, uh, Alzheimer's disease consists of both uh, a plaques, amyloid plaques, and tangle pathology. So what are these models that we have uh, currently uh, that demonstrate amyloid pathology? Uh, so the first generation, so to speak, are the relatively non-cell selective expression of wild type or mutant APP. Uh, the second generation uh, uh, are the uh, neuronal uh, promoter-driven APP expression with the familial AD mutations, and we're still using them. These are driven by promoters uh, of such as the PDGF, Thi1, uh, PRP, uh, et cetera. Uh, the third generation are the conditional expressions of APP. These are regulated by the TTA, the tetracycline transactivator, uh, uh, um, and uh, these were pioneered uh, by Joanna Jankowski, and more recently uh, uh, using those animal models by Leonard Mookie's lab. And finally, the fourth generation is where uh, we have humanized A-beta sequence with a FAD mutations that's knocked into the endogenous APP. Cephalon, the pharmaceutical company, uh, made one about 15 years or so ago, but the line has been lost. And then Taka Omiseto from Riken Institute in Japan has uh, uh, recently made, created another one uh, that's, uh, I, I should say, superior to the original one from Cephalon. But that's what we're currently, this is our current armamentarium, so to speak, uh, on mouse models uh, uh, modeling uh, amyloid pathology uh, in brain. So what I'm going to talk about, and uh, the, uh, most of the time that I have, is the so-called variation of the third-generation APP mice, uh, where it is now inducible site-specific expression in hippocampus to explore selective uh, neuronal uh, injury. And so I stress here which are the two components that's important. One is that it's inducible, so you can regulate the expression of the transgene and that it's site-specific, so we can target different populations within the brain. And what we've chosen are uh, the three uh, major hippocampal uh, populations. So what you see here is basically these animals are created by crossing three different transgenic lines. Uh, the GERC-4 uh, tree line, uh, so it's a, just a, a tree line, uh, GERC4 happens to be expressed uh, uh, selectively in the CA3 neurons in hippocampus, and when that's crossed to uh, a TTA, the trans, uh, detective cycling transactivator, uh, that's flanked uh, uh, or uh, uh, preceded by the lock stop lock cassette. So when, now, when these two lines are crossed, then it really results in the excision of the lock stop lock cassette uh, liberating TTA to be expressed. Then in, in uh, uh, the presence of the third transgenic line, uh, which has the uh, uh, tetracycline responsive element, uh, then the APP, in this case the Swedish-Indiana mutation, uh, is now expressed, and then now it's expressed preferentially in the CA3 of the hippocampus. So we can go through different variations of this, uh, uh, where now actually first is in the presence of doxycycline. So this is the so-called TET-OFF system. Uh, where normally uh, uh, we don't treat the animals, but in the presence of doxycycline, oops, shoot, darn. In the presence of doxycycline, uh, um, uh, uh, then uh, uh, TTA uh, 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 is blocked uh, from binding to uh, the APP transgene, and then now you have uh, suppression of the uh, transgen transgene expression. So uh, we're able to use three different uh, Cree lines. Uh, uh, they're all obtained from Tonegawa's lab, uh, uh, and, and then we can direct uh, uh, expression in the dente gyrus, the granule cells of the dente gyrus, uh, the CA3 neurons, and then also the CA1 neurons. And uh, his, uh, graphically, uh, now we can see here in one line, which is in the dente gyrus, this is using a DAB staining, and you can appreciate the brown staining that's just in the dentate uh, uh, gyrus of the hippocampus. Uh, it's a, in a six-month-old animal. Here you have it in CA3 uh, of the hippocampus. And then finally here you have it in CA1 uh, neurons of hippocampus. So. Uh, a nice demonstration of, uh, of the technology where we could, in fact, target our transgene expression just to three different populations in the hippocampus. I say, select, uh, I say it's preferential because it's not completely selective. Uh, nothing in biology is 100%, so we do have to live with that slight limitation. 
What is good, however, is that it is, in fact, inducible and highly regulatable. So here you have, uh, uh, and again, the, the transgenic animals stained with DAB or using fluorescence uh, to show that the, where the transgene is, is expressed. So here, in the non-transgenic mice, we see nothing. In the CA3 animals, you can see expression in CA3 uh, neurons over here. And finally, after two weeks of treatment with doxycycline, uh, then the uh, APP expression uh, goes away. And uh, you also note uh, 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 is that not all the neurons are positive. Uh, that's uh, age-related. As the animals get older, we get more and more neurons uh, that are positive for the transgene. So, so far, so good. Uh, um, we see the, uh, the, the predicted expression of our APP transgene uh, uh, in uh, different populations of the hippocampus and that we can also regulate its expression. So what will we do with these animals now that we have them? Uh, it took a long time to get there. And the first is to see if they have amyloid deposits, uh, and indeed uh, they do. And here showing a CA1 uh, and a CA3 animal and comparing it just to a human sample. And you can appreciate that here in CA1 animals is concentrated here at the tail end of the hippocampus and also over here, and that's really the subiculum region. I'll come back to that in a minute because that's very important. And in the CA3 animal, which is right here, uh, in this particular animal, we see some deposits up there. Uh, and uh, why is this important? Because, in fact, neurons that project their axons from CA1 project to the subiculum. Okay, it's, these are monosynapses uh, from here to the subiculum, whereas in CA3, they project from CA3 to the dendritic fields of the CA1 neuron, and you're going to see that graphically coming up soon. So what's here is that I'm telling you is that basically the, the deposits tend to be in the axonal axonal terminal fields of these neurons. So the deposits are not just forming anywhere. They're forming specifically where the axons terminate, uh, 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 sh suggesting uh, that uh, uh, a beta deposit is, in fact, unidirectional. It's not all over. It certainly is not around the cell bodies uh, at all. And so if you look at an AD brain where you see these deposits, it's really impossible to know where they er originated from, except that it's in the, the brain parenchyma. So we see amyloid deposits, so that's good. So the question then is, uh, what do these mice uh, uh, tell us? Uh, the, the re part of the reason we went to this uh, model, uh, 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 realizing that uh, um, the Leonard Mookie lab had already published uh, their tetracycline animal, which was expressing APP from the anorhinal cortex, is that in their case, they can really only measure the output uh, from the anorhinal cortex. What we want to know is a system where we could measure both the output from the, the neurons expressing the transgene, as well as the input, the afferent uh, uh, projections into the neural target population. So here you can see that these are the CA3 neurons that's expressing APP. The axonal targets uh, uh, project over to the CA1 neurons. So this is a very famous Schaefer collateral where we can stimulate and record from the CA1 neurons. So if you do uh, uh, that uh, uh, particular preparation and you can record a, a, a long-term potentiation, LTP, uh, in the CA1 neurons, and you can appreciate this is the control animal uh, and in the transgenic animal, uh, there's, there's uh, impairment of LTP. So there's depression of the long-term depression showing that there is defect in synaptic plasticity in this particular synapse when the transgene is ex expressed in the CA3 neuron. So as I said, uh, uh, in this system, it allows us to now also stimulate the incoming fiber, input fibers to CA3 neurons. Uh, these are the same CA3 uh, uh, transgenic mice, and you can see now there is no difference uh, in LTP. So the uh, uh, um, uh, deficit, the impairment uh, in LTP that's predicted in these uh, mice, is only specific when you stimulate the outf uh, uh, outflow pathway, the efferent pathway, but not when you stimulate the incoming or the afferent pathway, showing that in fact the cell that expresses APP by itself do not demonstrate any deficits uh, in synaptic plasticity. So here's summarizing what I just told you, that only neurons postsynaptic to the site of APP expression exhibit evidence of synaptic injury. So I just showed you here that using the same animals here, uh, uh, that simulation of the output or the input, uh, one shows uh, impairment and the other uh, does not. Uh, the, the beauty that we have multiple neuronal systems being driven by this, uh, 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 these crelocks is that we can now look at the CA1 mice and when you do that, as I just told you, CA1 projects the synaptic, uh, to the subiculum. So when you stimulate the outflow from the CA1 to subiculum, you see uh, LTP impairment. 
But now if you simulate the Schaefer collateral projecting the CA1 neuron, uh, uh, just as I showed you earlier, uh, in the uh, uh, dentate gyrus and there's no LTP impairment. So in two neuronal populations, we see this, what I would call now a generalized phenomenon, uh, which is that only uh, APP that's expressed in the presynaptic neuron uh, would elicit uh, 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 impairment in the uh, postsynaptic uh, 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 synapse. So expression uh, in APP, presynaptic neurons cause synaptic impairments in postsynaptic neurons, uh, uh, and is this how perhaps a synaptic uh, a dysfunction propagates? You can imagine that each neuron is expressing APP, of which then it uh, uh, poisons uh, uh, the uh, postsynaptic neuron, and so on, so forth, along the uh, transsynaptic pathways. So what about the synapses themselves? I've just showed you uh, only with uh, uh, electrophysiology and uh, 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 long-term potentiation. So here's a, a, a simple diagram of hippocampal circuitry. I'm not a neuroanatomist, so the, this is something that even I can understand. Uh, but basically, it's just to highlight that in these different neural populations that I just showed you, uh, dentate, CA3, CA1, uh, uh, the, the circuitry is very worked out by neurophysiologists and neuroanatomists uh, over the years. And uh, this is where the projection fields go, simply, which is that CA1 projects to the CA3, projects to the CA1 area, both in this uh, stratum orient and stratum radiatum. CA2 projects to the distal side of the CA1. And then these black is very important because these uh, uh, black dot synapses are projecting out from the, hippoc uh, from the hippocampus originating from the anorhinal cortex that's coming in. So if you look at system where our tr transgene is expressed here, then this is the uh, SR is the um, recurrent collateral. So uh, the CA3 neurons project not only the CA1, but then they make collaterals, the synapse on their own dendrites. So we can look at uh, uh, synaptic fields here or up there and see what happens in these animals. And, uh, uh, so here, uh, um, uh, by uh, immunofluorescence showing synaptophysin, so this is in the CA1 region and CA3. So this is the uh, SOs, uh, stratum orients and stratum radiatum. And in CA3 area, this is the SO, and then we call it SR, which is really composed of both uh, stratum radiatum and the uh, uh, SL uh, layers. So what happens when you uh, go in there and uh, quantify these synapses using synaptophysin staining? And what you can see is that at six months old, we don't see any changes, but at uh, year-old animals, you can see that there's about a 10, 15% reduction in synaptophysin puncta as a surrogate marker for synapses uh, in brain and it's in both the SR and the SO layer uh, coming from the CA3 neurons. Uh, for sake of brevity, I won't show you. We've also looked at uh, uh, synapses here, and uh, there are no changes. Uh, we didn't depend only on synaptophysin using another synaptic marker. This is PSD95 for, uh, uh, to highlight uh, uh, the postsynaptic site. You can appreciate that both the same areas show roughly the same amount to the degree of synapse loss. Uh, I wouldn't uh, feel too comfortable if we depended only uh, on these immunofluorescence. So uh, with the help of uh, Mark Ellison's lab at UCSD, uh, uh, where we uh, looked at by EM using the so-called SBEM, the uh, serial block face EM, where you can now serially section uh, through the hippocampus, uh, and then you can laboriously uh, go in there and count all the synapses. Uh, looking at the uh, postsynaptic junction, you can count them, and in fact, uh, we do see synapse loss in this exact same area. And by EM, it's a little more sensitive, and we see about now about a 20% uh, a synapse loss. So that confirms it, that in fact, in the uh, axonal tips, in the axonal fields, uh, where these uh, APP expression, where the, uh, uh, the axons terminate uh, from the neurons, from CA3 neurons, we see about 10 to 20% loss of synapses. And uh, what's interesting is that if you now go in there, and even more laborious, uh, a serially uh, or reconstruct from serial sections of dendritic tree, uh, you can now also count the number of spines that's on the dendrites. And when you do that, you also see a reduction in number of spines. And in this case, uh, there's even more reduction, about a 50% reduction in, in spines in these animals. Uh, what's interesting is that has been noted in, in uh, uh, MCI cases in humans is that uh, um, uh, while the synapses may be lost, the length of the postsynaptic density uh, where the synapses actually uh, occur uh, uh, gets larger. 
as if there's a compensatory response. That is, when the synapses begin to go away, the remaining synapses compensate by getting bigger, so you can gain synaptic strength in the, in the setting where the synapses are, 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 are reducing. And so we see the same phenomenon here. Uh, uh, so you can see this by looking at a, a cumulative plot or just by looking at the average length. So in these animals at one year old, they lose synapses, but then the remaining one uh, uh, gets larger. So that's nice. So we see that. So the question is that are these synaptic changes that describe both electrophysiologically and morphologically uh, relevant? And so we turn to uh, uh, behavioral studies. And now we, what we see is that both CA1 and CA3 targeted mice uh, show behavioral deficits, but they're subtly different, uh, which is actually uh, uh, quite interesting. So here, this is just in the training sessions. Uh, we don't use uh, um, the Morris water maze, but use the uh, Barnes dry maze. And you can see that during the training, there's deficits uh, uh, in the transgenic mice. Uh, 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 so they are slower in acquiring uh, 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 the, uh, the escape. And then uh, uh, if you look at the uh, probe trial, you can see that uh, uh, here are the non-transgenic mice. They don't, uh, uh, they, they freeze more in the target, or they spend more time in the target quadrant. Uh, whereas in the transgenic mice, uh, they don't differentiate between the target and the non-target quadrants, uh, uh, showing that they really didn't quite uh, uh, have learned the task. And uh, when you now wait for the two weeks later to do the uh, retention, uh, uh, they seem to remember uh, where the target is, but then when you do a reversal that you cause them to, to learn a slightly new spatial uh, map, uh, then the uh, uh, CA1 uh, uh, transgenic mice uh, do worse than the CA3. So they both show some deficits, but here they're suddenly different in the reversal stage. And uh, uh, what's interesting is that if you now look at another uh, a paradigm, which is the fear conditioning, then you can see that uh, uh, here uh, um, you put the animals in a box where, you, where they're subjected to an electric uh, shock and whether they, they learn and whether they freeze. And in the non-transgenic mice, obviously, they have learned and they, they freeze in the context but in our uh, 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 um, CA1 and the CA3 mice, I'm sorry, the CA1 mice uh, uh, froze, but then the CA3, the CA3 mice did not freeze, but the, uh, 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 I'm sorry, uh, I didn't have enough coffee this morning. The uh, uh, CA1 mice uh, uh, did not freeze, but the CA3 mice froze. And that apparently is consistent for those who study hippocampal physiology, uh, that the uh, CA3 uh, neurons are not quite as susceptible uh, to uh, uh, spatial information. And uh, so apparently if you express APB and CA3 mice, then uh, they seem to do fine uh, in a spatial context. Uh, my uh, a collaborator, uh, Stefan Leutgelb at UCSD, uh, is a uh, uh, neurophysiologist studying place cells. So we've been collaborating on these mice and they have an even cuter uh, maze uh, that uh, some of you may not know. Uh, um, and I've never heard of it until uh, we started working together. So I thought I would describe this a little bit. And this is so-called figure eight maze. So what happens in figure eight maze is that uh, you put the animal in here where now there are two arms. So they start here, they run down, and then the food pellet is on either side. And then what they have to learn is that the first time they go left, the food pellet is there. They come back here. And the next time they have to remember which side they turned, which was uh, uh, to the left side. The next time they have to turn to the right side to collect the pellet. So here, the next time they do that. The third time, if they come back, they have to go to the left. If they go to the right, then they do not get the reward. So basically, the mouse has to go alternating left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right. And then so it means that they have to remember where they turned uh, uh, the last time. And so what happens is there are two doors here. So the mouse comes back here. You can hold the mouse there briefly. And that's the key. How long do you hold that? It's a test of their recent memory. Okay. Uh, uh, and in this particular case, in the transgenic mice, if you hold them for two seconds or 10 seconds, so they come back and you hold them as short as only two seconds, they will forget where they turned the last time. So in this particular case, you can see in the, uh, the control versus transgenic mice, after training, they get them right almost 90% of the time, left, right, left, right. So really quite remarkable accuracy. Uh, but then if you just hold them for, 20 sec for two seconds, then their accuracy drops down to about 75 and 70%. That's only in the transgenic mice. So another example that these animals, which only has uh, a very few neurons expressing uh, uh, APP transgene, uh, uh, and that uh, they show uh, the memory deficit. 
what we had hoped was basically when we see these deficits, we get into a situation where now we can look at no more permanent uh, neuronal deficits and then what happens uh, in the brain. But unexpectedly, as it says here, the synaptic damage is reversible. So here we have a 12-month-old animal, what I showed you earlier, you can see the uh, uh, um, LPTT impairment in the transgenic mice, uh, but that after two weeks of doxycycline treatment, uh, the transgenic mice uh, behave normally uh, in LTP. So uh, even though we see synapse loss in these animals, uh, 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 and we see all these compensatory changes, turns out just a brief two-week treatment uh, uh, reverses uh, those deficits. And uh, uh, same thing, if you look at the synapse counts, the uh, earlier we see about a 10, 15% drop in synaptophysin, uh, uh, and uh, they go away, and as is uh, counting uh, by EM. So in these animal models, uh, uh, as much as we see all the deficit we would have predicted, morphology, physiologically, and behaviorally, uh, they all recovered, uh, uh, and that's something we hadn't expected. Uh, as I showed you here, uh, year-old animals, we've gone to 18 months old, same thing, these animals recover after just a brief treatment uh, uh, for doxycycline to uh, uh, um, inhibit APP expression. I'm not going to show you all the data where we uh, also showed that, in fact, it is due to A-beta rather than just APP overexpression. Uh, it's not the forum for, for uh, all the details. But suffice to say, this is what I want to summarize in terms of these animals that I just described. That's the gene targeting can preferentially target APP to multiple neuronal groups uh, in hippocampus to delineate role of the pre versus postsynaptic neurons in synaptic injury. Uh, uh, the impairment in LTP seen when APP is expressed in pre, uh, but not postsynaptic neurons. Uh, the A-beta is deposited at or near axonal terminals, but not around cell body or in the dendritic fields. And that synaptic defects and synapse loss are secondary to A-beta from presynaptic terminals, uh, but if affecting postsynaptic sites. I didn't show you any of uh, those experiments for that conclusion. Uh, and that the CA1 and CA3 targeted mice show behavioral impairments, but they're subtly different. So not all the neuronal populations in the hippocampus, even though they are presumably uh, are working together in this uh, a short-term memory circuit, uh, they are specialized in, uh, in, their in their function, and that's reflected by how we targeted APP to these neurons. And surprisingly, the physical loss and morphological changes in synapses are reversible after doxycycline treatment to inhibit transgene expression. And so these APP transgenic mice do not result in permanent synaptic changes, as would be predicted uh, to, occur, to occur uh, in Alzheimer's disease. So very briefly, I just want to tell you a little bit about the tau mice, where we use the same strategy instead of targeting APP uh, to the CA1, CA3 neurons. We targeted tau, and in this case, the P3010 muta uh, P3 mutation uh, seen in the frontal temporal dementia. Uh, to the same neuronal uh, populations. Here are just a uh, 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 picture showing uh, by age two, six, and 12 month old tau animals. Uh, green is the uh, transgene, the tau transgene. So initially, only a few neurons are positive, then gradually quite a few more. And then when you get into month old, uh, 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 a bit more. And, but what uh, was rather pretty is basically where the green now is, is where all the axonal uh, 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 tau uh, uh, is now uh, located uh, from the neurons that's expressing tau. Unlike the APP case where you saw yesterday very nicely from Subojit how APP is rapidly moving back and forth down the up and down the axon. In tau, in this particular case, tau is binding to microtubules, so basically once bound, they're just uh, uh, now fixed, so somewhat fixed uh, in space within the axons. So this is all the axonal projections of tau uh, from these neurons, uh, from uh, uh, the CA3 and in, in higher power without all the other confusing colors, you can see how nicely uh, uh, the expression pattern is for CA3 expressed tau and all the way to, through their axonal fields. So what happens in these animals? I'm gonna only show you one of the result, which is now we do the same thing. We record uh, uh, from the CA3 uh, uh, Schaefer collateral to CA1 uh, that I showed you earlier. Uh, and indeed, we see just now instead of uh, synaptic, instead of impairment, uh, in synaptic plasticity, we basically have wiped out LTP. We just don't even, in fact, see any LTP in the uh, uh, postsynaptic neuron uh, uh, tr by uh, uh, um, stimulating the Schaefer collateral to the CA1 neuron. And then now, however, 
if you stimulate the mossy fiber from CA, from the dentate to CA3, you also see a wiping out of the uh, um, uh, uh, um, uh, LTP. And that's in contrast to what I showed you earlier with the CA3 neurons, which is in fact expressing APP. We see no LTP impairment, but here very clearly it contrasts uh, uh, quite uh, uh, significantly uh, from the pattern between tau and APP. So now tau expression in CA3 neurons produce distinctly different effects uh, on synaptic plasticity than APP expression. Not surprisingly, these are two different uh, molecules, uh, but on the other hand, these are two uh, uh, proteins, two pathologies that we see at the same time uh, in the brains of AD individuals. So what's the take home message uh, from my brief talk here? So which is that A-beta toxicity progresses anterogradely, uh, presumably by the release of A-beta from presynaptic neurons. Tau is different. Uh, toxicity likely originates from presynaptic release of tau, as in the propagation theory uh, 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 that's uh, first proposed uh, by uh, Mark Diamond, uh, but also in a cell autonomous fashion, that is neurons that express uh, 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 tau can itself uh, manifest in toxicity, uh, and that the reversibility of amyloid associated pathology in mice indicates that if treatment is instituted early, one would predict clinical response. Uh, because we could reverse everything. Now, the bad news is that that may be a tall order because of what is early enough. Uh, in our mice, we can start as early as we wish, but in humans, we really cannot do that. So that makes uh, uh, the possibility that any time you use an amyloid treatment, it may be that you have to start very, very early before that irreversibility stage is, is reached. In APP transgenic mice, they're woefully short of modeling AD or as my friend Dale Bredesen used to call it, we call them the Mouseheimer. They're really not Alzheimer mites, so anyone who says that we have an Alzheimer mites is, uh, is being inaccurate because they really don't model all aspects or in fact many aspects of Alzheimer's disease other than amyloid pathology. And in, the, in the, our inability to model the linkage between A, beta, and tau, the two cardinal pathology is hampering preclinical studies uh, and their translation to therapies. And unfortunately, that's uh, uh, where after 20 or 25 years of work at, you know, in this area, uh, uh, we, we still haven't been able to get uh, over this uh, hurdle. Well, Karen Shao Ash uh, uh, in the University of Minnesota, in fact, uh, had predicted all this uh, 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 back in 2010, where she put all the animal models uh, here in the pre-MCI stage. And certainly in our animals, we see exactly the same thing. Uh, which is that uh, we're even, not even short of MCI in these, in these animal models. Uh, the good thing is that we're modeling a very early stage of AD. The bad thing is that it really isn't Alzheimer's disease yet uh, uh, in these animals. So then uh, concluding is that if you imagine doing strategy of therapeutic strategies for AD that targets uh, uh, um, uh, amyloid, uh, uh, what are these avenues and what's left for us to, to do? You have APP, uh, the precursor that generates A-beta, and presumably you have the more toxic A-beta, longer A-beta-42 form, ends up aggregating into fibrils. You can, uh, uh, the, some of the amyloid that doesn't aggregate uh, can be uh, degraded and cleared from the brain. Uh, so where are these targets? Well, you can block them uh, by uh, secretase inhibitors. Now we're basically only down to beta secretase. The gamma secretases haven't worked. Theoretically, you can perturb trafficking. We don't have any compounds uh, in the clinic at this time. Uh, uh, you can now do also gamma secretase modulation, which is an area I worked in uh, uh, for some years, but the only one that's left standing now is a, a compound from Pfizer uh, that seems to be quite selective for lowering A-beta-42. Uh, the anti-aggregation is still around. It hasn't died. In fact, the uh, uh, trimuprostate, the original Ozimed compound, it's now been uh, rising in the Phoenix and it's coming back again uh, uh, for another attempt. And uh, uh, you can also have uh, clear the A-beta, presumably, and certainly the most uh, important of which are the immunotherapies, uh, uh, and even IVIG uh, hasn't completely gone away uh, in, in, in hopes that it might clear A-beta uh, from brain. And then uh, you have also perhaps looking at uh, neuroprotective anti-inflammatory pathways, and that includes anticonvulsants, uh, uh, um, as well as even uh, uh, TNF. And then last but not least is to look at the uh, uh, tau uh, uh, component of the AD pathology. And again, immunotherapy seems to be leading that area. So this is a very nice, you can draw these diagrams. I've had this diagram for a number of years. I keep just changing the drugs as to what's still 
uh, in play, uh, uh, as many of them fall by the wayside. Uh, so uh, hopefully uh, 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 we will, in fact, get there uh, uh, by if uh, amyloid uh, therapies were to work uh, through one of these main areas and others that I haven't thought about. So thank you very much for your attention, for inviting me here. And these are people who have done the work uh, both uh, uh, in, uh, at UCSD and also in Singapore and my colleagues at UCSD. So thank you very much.